Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca, home of New York's craft cider. I love New York. Plan your getaway at visitithaca.com. Welcome to the Grape Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Matthew Conway. We'll talk to Matt about the p- pandemic, Northern Rhone wines, the move to Charleston from New York City, and opening a wine bar. We'll taste one of our all time favorite Northern Rhones for our weekly wine sip. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for the Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Matthew Conway headed east to New York City around 2003. After three years with Chef Gray Coons, Matthew hooked up with Mark Forgione at his eponymous restaurant for over a dozen years as beverage director and GM, creating a unique wine program with a nod, not a nord, a nod to the Northern Rhone. Matthew also helped Mark Forgione reopen neighborhood fave Peasant. The pandemic reunited Matthew with his family in Charleston, South Carolina. After too much fishing and helping some friends, Matthew fulfilled a dream and recently opened Tippling House, a new Charleston wine bar. Welcome back to the Grape Nation, Matthew. We're talking to Matt remotely via Zencaster. Matt, where are you right now? I am in my office at the Tippling House on Cumming Street in downtown Charleston, South Carolina. All right. We're going to get to that in a few minutes, but I want to ask you about a bunch of other things before we talk Tippling. So you spent almost two decades in hospitality in New York City. Um, It's always hard to predict the future, but this time the pandemic had a hand in that with you. Tell me what you were doing right before COVID-19 hit. Um, Tell me what happened with you, what you were doing during the pandemic. And it did have an ultimate effect on you personally and professionally. And I want you to tell me about that. Um, So this will frame things and give us a little context of, you know, where you were and how you got to where you are. So right before the pandemic, what were you doing? Uh, sure. I mean, first, thanks for having me back. Happy to be here. Um, right before the pandemic hit, I was devoting my time and energy to uh, the peasant space in Nolita, uh, which we had just acquired from Frank and Dulcie, who had operated that space for 20 beautiful years. Uh, It was one of my favorite restaurants before we had the opportunity to take over the space. And uh, we did that the first week in January. Uh, We assumed most of their staff. So I had spent January, February, and March working around the clock with a few of our Forge team and the bulk of the old peasant team to try to transform it from Frank and Dulcie's uh, peasant to Mark Forgione's peasant. 
Right. And then in the midst of that, you get hit by COVID, right? Sure. I mean, it's something I don't even like to talk about too much anymore. So we can speed through that as it's quite a boring subject. Everybody, everybody had their story. Um, mine was no different, not knowing which way was up or down or what tomorrow would hold. Right. But Especially knew, in the hospitality business. I knew one thing and that's, uh, the restaurants were going to be closed for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I knew that my fiance who was running events for La Conda Verde had been furloughed and that events, private events anywhere, but especially in New York city were going to be a long time before they would be held again. So my family had moved from New York to Charleston about five years before that. And my sister, my whole family, but my sister is in F and B hospitality down here. And they have a nice home in a suburb of Charleston called James Island. And they had a, a big backyard and it's sunny down here. And so Chris and I packed up our, two dogs and a week's worth of clothes and rented a car in Newark and drove Newark to Charleston and set up for a week. A week turned into a month. A month turned into three months. Our lease was up in Battery Park City and things were still looking quite gloom. So we decided rather than moving out of Battery Park to a, you know, somewhere deep in Brooklyn or Queens or Westchester, right? because we had no idea what financially would be possible with restaurants and events either closed or, or barely reopening. We, we thought it best to um, bring our stuff down here. So it was three, four months before you came back to grab everything. We left originally March 17th and then we came back at the end of June and spent about three weeks in New York city Right. Uh, packing up our stuff and we moved into our apartment here on, you know, first first or second week of July 2020. Were you thinking that that may be temporary or in the back of your mind maybe even excited? You thought, you know, maybe this is a move, the move? I mean, where was your head at then? Uh, my head was at taking everything one day at a time. I right. felt blessed all things considered to be able to be close to my family, um, healthy. And I focused on what tomorrow was. I definitely, you know, was still actively involved with the restaurants in New York from a distance, but I was also, you know, focused on what possibilities could come my way either in Charleston or potentially another market. My, it was the first time in 14 years that I wasn't committed to being in a New York city space five or more days a week. So I kind of explored the opportunities of what the possibilities were mostly with my imagination, but also through some of my connections to just explore you know, what was possible while doing everything in my being to uh, help my staff back in New York City. Right. So you did stay connected um, to the job from afar, which a lot of people did. A um, little harder in the hospitality business, but, you know, sure. most people, were, I mean, I most people were working from home. But Yeah, I mean, working from home is hard in hospitality, but we – you know, sold a big portion of the seller and, and did a bunch of things that were important to try to stay afloat. But I did a lot of work with the local city, uh, state, and even federal government to try to get uh, help through our insurance programs. I helped uh, try to get, you know, program government programs for our staff, assistance, uh, nonprofit organizations. I mean, our State Senator Kavanaugh's office, I was on the phone with them three or four days a week uh, trying to get 
answers and aid for for my team in in New York. Uh, so there was a lot of work to do, but most of it for me, or a lot of it, was just spiritually guided and trying to help the people that you know had poured so much of their own lives into you know providing for us. So That's awesome. I to do everything I could to give back in any meaningful way. That's great. Um, so a few things happened. I mean, obviously restaurants close, they open, they close, they open. Um, you've already made the move to Charleston. You know, you're doing your best to help everyone um, in New York. And like you said, where I said you're doing it from afar. But at some point, and I stumble on it on Instagram, you decide that your relationship um, with Mark Forgione, you know, has come to an end, which was recent. I mean, when was that? You know, why that time? Um, you knew, you know, that you were going to pursue other things. You know, tell me about what how that decision came about. Well, we, you know, we worked throughout that end of 2020, and Chris was fortunate enough to get a job here through a former New Yorker and somebody that my sister had known, uh, Noah Singerman, who had been, who is the director of operations for the Leon's group, which Leon's is, you know, right. Brooks's place. Yeah. Yeah, Brooks writes his place. Who's a hell of a dude. Brooks. Hell of a restaurant tour hospitality guy. Right. Sure. But more importantly, Brooks is just a great, great dude. And, uh, been very helpful to my, me and Chris's uh, transition here to Charleston. But Noah hired Chris to run events for, for Leon's. And so, you know, we had a job. I think that was the most important thing there. Um, right. So we did what we and a, did. And a good one. A great one. Great restaurant, yeah. great team, great yeah. people. Yeah, right in her wheelhouse right in her wheelhouse and the events program back there in the shed, uh, which is what they call it behind Leon's. Right. We cook on an open fire. It's got lots of looks it can do. And Carissa pours a lot of her passion into um, events and curating special moments for people, you know, depending on what they're trying to accomplish. And that, that space offers a lot of flexibility. So she was, you know, doing well, financially and emotionally and spiritually. Uh, so we had a job, which was better than what we'd been doing for the months before that. Right. Uh, and I was doing a lot of fishing and, you know, doing a lot of, uh, you know, work from afar and soul searching and just things that I think everybody did throughout COVID kind of putting, uh, the value on what's really valuable, you know? And, something I realized early on is that when the shit hits the fan and, you know, things crumble to, to nothing, you know, what do you really have? And for me, uh, you know, family and friendships were, were two of the most important things to kind of be in good health. Like you mentioned. Yeah. I mean, health. Yes. But just, you know, my guiding light through those, dark times was family and friends, you know, reassurances of, you know, what would get you excited about tomorrow. And, um, so I was getting more comfortable with the idea of of staying here and its proximity to New York. And I made a few trips back, uh, in the summer of 2020, in the fall of 2020, I went, I came back in October and, you know, we did an event at peasant with staff from, both restaurants and, you know, to see people smiling again and and having drinks together was reassuring. And I planned on coming back in March of 2021 uh, for a Paule event that we held at uh, the restaurant with um, Raj uh, from you know, who had left Danielle during, I think you just had him on the show. So most yeah, Raj, Raj, yeah. Most He's actually, we have Lafitte coming up this weekend. Sure. So most of your listeners should be familiar with, with good old Raj V and 
I'd come up there to do a Amaroos dinner or lunch, sorry. Um, and, you know, in the fall of 2020, I had, you know, introduced um, Dustin Wilson and Sabado, who were starting a company, Apre Crew, to um, our team and Mark. And they were in you know, interested in taking an interest in the company moving forward coming out right. of COVID. So I came back in March and did the event and met with them. And, you know, 14 years I spent uh, in that same, you know, restaurant group, or I could just say, you know, in close partnership with Mark Forgione. Um, and I love him like a brother. Um so it wasn't an easy decision by any stretch, but I could just, you know, I knew in March when I came back and met with the Apre crew team and spoke with uh, Mark and, you know, where my heart was at down here and what uh, right. Mark's vision was for the future of his company. Um, you know, it was a good time to, to, to step away. It was good. You know, I always wanted to, do everything for my staff, uh, especially at Mark Ford Jones. A lot of many of those people, I you know, worked with me for you know five, six, some ten years. You know, I have one porter at Mark Ford Jones, uh, Milo Estrada, who came from Puebla, and you know, we worked together for ten years. I wow, had intimate relationships. Uh, so I always valued and cherished those. So I, I, it was, you know, difficult for me to want to step away from that. But, you know, Mark had a vision for what he wanted his future to be, which coming out of COVID with all the self-reflection is different uh, than what I wanted for my future if I were to stay with that company. And I mean, I don't think it's unusual in the restaurant business. And I certainly don't think anything should be unusual after COVID. But the bottom No, and, thing, and the Apre Crew thing. You know, which kind of put him in a place, you know, that would help him advance too. Sure. You know, it, it seemed like a good clean break for you. It was. And I want. So, wait, when was that? Was that in the summer? I mean, we. I mean, this. When so did you go on Instagram and say, I want to tell everyone? I'm- I mean, it took. It was. It's a, it's a tangled web we weave, you know, 14 years. So, it, right. took, it took some conversations and, you know, negotiations to officially, you know, separate from, right. you know, I was a, I was a, an official partner. So we had to work through, work through that. Right. So it took Legal a while from March to summertime and I was gentle cause I didn't want to rock the boat. I wish, um, you know, definitely the, the staff members that I care so much about, but also, you know, chef and the new team that took over, I wish them all the success in the world. It's a great restaurant group driven by, you know, good souls that pour their heart into this industry. And I certainly didn't want to do anything to jeopardize, um, you know, the view of uncertainty. So I waited for everything to be whatever before I made the announcement, but I knew, you know, in spring that we were were working towards that. It just needed to take some time. And so I took the time to, you know, work through that process and, uh, the bottom line is though, is that I was happy here. You know, I was happy with right. you, you knew way, I'm but happy with my life. I'm happy yeah. with the pace the- and, and most importantly <laughs> to this whole process, <clears throat> which I think is a good segue out of that is the wine community down here embraced me and the wine community is, is bold and diverse for a very small town down here. And, you know, all of the great wines of the world, even if it's in small quantities, make their way here. And they make their way here over other small towns because of some of the people we spoke about before we got on the air, which is, you know, the way- You know, it's funny that what you just said, you know, that last few paragraphs answers about four questions that I was going to ask, but we still need to go into detail. And I think when we talk about, you know, Tippling House and all that, we're going to talk about the community. Um, so you sever, not sever, you considerately leave um, your past 
Um, you do it delicately, just like you help people during the pandemic. You were protective, you know, of how you handled your exit. Not a ton of people in the business, you know, with that consideration. So, you know, kudos to you. You're you were in Charleston when you did that. You're there now. Um, before I get into stuff, you're not getting out of this podcast without talking about some specific wine stuff. So let me tap your brain on a few things, and then you know we'll talk about Charleston and Tipling. Um, you truly are one of the real evangelists of Northern Rhone wines. Um, I mean, what was that connection? Why is the region so special? Why is it so special? You, you know, what what was that? What what brought you to that? You know, where you're still so, you know, um, you know, interested and in love with the wines. Why Northern Rhone wines? I mean, what's his name? David from Tribeca is like a Southern Rhone guy, and I'm sure you like Southern Rhone wines. But you know, there's a love there. Tell me a little about how that came about. Uh, I think, you know, David Gordon is a huge ambassador for Southern Rhone wines. I think they gave him the key to Avignon, uh, and he's a dear friend and one of the funniest guys I know. Yes. I just, am I allowed to swear on here? <laughs> yes. Not, not, not excessively, but <laughs> not that where I want it, to, I just sometimes they say, no, where, where it adds of, the emotion, you absolutely can. Because when I think of David Gordon, I think of the funniest motherfucker I know. And I just, yes, I just that's the way you use it. it. But, yeah. um, you know, Pascaline with the Loire. Uh, right. I think of, you know, when I think of Burgundy, I think of Robert Bohr. When I think of, you know what I mean? Like there's regions yeah. that uh, have people's heart. And people soul. that have been associated. Their hearts have been with it for a while. Yep. And not from a import distribution, uh, whatever, but from a sommelier. Sommeliers advocating not only for their customers, but for other sommeliers to embrace a region. I think, you know, not everybody finds that. If you're asking why I fell in love with the Northern Rhone, I think there's some very simple answers that I think anybody would say about the region that they identify with. It feels like home to me. I'm comfortable with the climate. The I'm from I'm originally from Northern California at the right. hills of the Sierra Nevadas, and the Ardèche has similar, you know, geography and climate to that area of California. Um, you know, where kind of mountains meet valleys and you know rivers and it's just a very pretty area, uh, temperate climate. The people there by French standards are, you know, pleasant and healthy and it feels good. The flowers in the springtime are just bountiful and gorgeous. It just everything about the people, the cuisine, the landscape, uh, and then most importantly, the wines why Syrah does it for me if I had to explain it, which it's, you know, it's like asking somebody why cheeseburger is their favorite food. It just does it for you. But right. I don't like sweet wines. I'm not a, you know, big in California Cabernet guy. Sure. But even like Fruity sugar in general, I don't eat dessert. I don't, oh, okay. I'm not like, I'm not a sugar guy. I just never have been. And you know, so in the wine world, whether that's, you know, wines with sugar like Demi Sec or, you know, you know, Rieslings, things that have sugar or whether it's like you're talking about sweet fruit in California, Cabernet, or it's just not, I like savory. And I think at its best, Syrah uh, as a variety of Vitis vinifera is just such a great balance of savory characteristics that I enjoy in a, in a glass of wine, you know, whether that's the herbal side or, you know, pepper. Right. Or the roasted meats, meats or like the things that people, the, you know, hallmark signatures of, of the variety of grape just turned me on and I've always loved it. And that first trip that I went to, the Northern Rhone, which was 20, uh, 10, Four, 10? 10, 2010. And I went with my 
best friend, Guillaume Lebron Breton, who I, uh, the baby affectionately called baby G right. Who I met while working at Tyvant. Uh, and he's good friends with the Clusel Roque family. So we stayed in Guillaume Clusel's bedroom in his family's house because he was in the <laughs> southern hemisphere. So when I met Guillaume a few years later, I got to shake his hand in New York and say, Hi, how are you? My name's Matthew. I've slept in your bed. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's he a, knew. a weird thing to say to another man yeah. at a tasting in New York. But uh, so we stayed with the Clusel family, and you know, they have a treasure trove of wines, you know, going back a half century that they would pop with the food that they were cooking us that was, you know, local. And we met um, Gangloff, you know, some producers that were not so popular or even known right. in 2010. But we also had the luxury to be tasting 09s and 10s out of barrels, which I definitely – think 10 is a much better vintage for me, but I, I, the, they're two good wines to be drinking. And, you know, we got to go meet, uh, Olivier and his father at clap and, you know, Thierry Alamond. Wow. Spent a lot of time with us. And just after I knew, I knew right away. It was like when I met Carissa, you know, <laughs> you, you that, know when, that that's it. You know when it's yeah. meant to be, and I just fell. Uh, I fell for the region all in, and I've gone back every year, at least once a year, with the exception of that COVID stint. But right. the first, first plane I got back on internationally was to go right back to Mauve and took Carissa to see, mostly to see friends. I mean, we did a little tasting, but it was mostly to gather with people that you know. You start to get to know the people and. You know, on that trip, I haven't been able to share this anywhere appropriately, so this might be the best place to to share this, but it was just, you know, Raj V had joined us for a, a quick stint of the trip, and he had to leave, um, but we were tasting with Jean-Louis Chave, which I consider an honor and a pleasure every time I've had the opportunity. Um, his... Uh, agree. His... Uh, grasp on being the steward of a historical domain for a short period of time is second to none. His appreciation for um, Syrah and the community is second to none. He's a, he's a gentleman and it's just everything you could want from somebody that has such important holdings in your favorite region and Raj had to had to run towards the end of the tasting to catch his train. So it was just his wife, Erin, had already been in the States, come back to the States with the children. So it was just me, Carissa, and Jean-Louis in the cellar finishing the tasting, tasting the 2020 um, out of barrel. Uh, and there, it's always the same routine with tasting the individual – um, crews of Hermitage separately before they're blended. And he was talking about a very famous um, old school, old sommelier in Paris that runs a Vietnamese restaurant that everybody loves. And Jean-Louis was expressing his love for, for that particular guy and his passion for specifically the Clos Florentine, Florentine that, um, Jean-Louis makes and he turned and gave me a compliment, which was, you know, that he doesn't, you know, people come to see wine, great wineries in France and most of the people that come through Mauve um, to see Jean-Louis and maybe a, one or two other producers, they're in France to visit, you know, the great domains of Burgundy or right, Bordeaux Champagne or potentially Bordeaux or here and there right. come to the Rhone. It's just to see Jean-Louis Chave because, you know, of his prestige in the region. And Jean-Louis said, there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm, you know, always appreciative of being on that short list, 
but the people he's like i can only count the people like you on on less than one hand and maybe wow fingers on that one hand of people that come here wow and, and care about the little ones and when he said little ones he specified i don't deem them little but right the you know our dash wines the you know Coterone from the north, the you know, just IOP Syrah, the the wines that don't are everyday drinking table wines. And he said, you know, I've followed you on social media for a long time, and you care and put as much energy into those wines, if not more, than you do the big name wines of Shav and Gonan and Clap and Alamond. And, you know, I know you have respect for those wines, but he said from a distance and from knowing you for the past decade, I really admire the fact that I know that you really love and care about this region and it shows in everything that you do. And coming from him, I mean, I'm, I'm melted, but. As you should. <laughs> it was so, a, it was a truly honor to have him say that to me, but I I believe that I've 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 done what he said, and I do care about promoting, you know, the new wines, the old wines, but anybody that I think's doing the work in the vineyard and in the cellar right. the right way, regardless of the price point, I try to embrace and support those vignerons, but it doesn't make me special. It just makes me uh, a, well, geek, a he, geek for the Northern Rhone. But, you know, Pascaline does the same thing for the Loire. For the Loire like, Valley, absolutely. On, and oftentimes the wines that I like from the Loire that have all the bells and whistles aren't the ones that Pascaline loves because she's looking at it from the same geeky way that I am. And right. You know, I don't expect people to be me in the Rhone or Pascaline in the Loire. I just know who I am and what gets me excited and see. Right, right. Some people of these can young producers take your lead or your advice or see what you're doing. But that's yeah, you so know, what like you're we doing. We do an event every year and we gather at this one star Michelin property that we, you know, go to just because it has good outdoor seating. And we gather a bunch of the young vignerons and, you know, uh, usually I. Uh, per, put it together with Antoine and Maxime Grio, and we do a tasting there before and everybody shows up and then we go and we eat and people bring bottles. And this year they invited a couple names of people that I hadn't known um, before, like Julian Graham Bott, B-O-T-T. And, uh, you know, there was a couple others and they were young. They were, you know, it, they're very young and they're passionate yeah. about their own and they're farming organically and, very you know, cool. They brought their wines and I was so excited, like, because the last time we did this before COVID, you know, I had Pierre Rostang, Rostang, who I think, you know, is taking over for dad and doing tremendous work. And we had, you know, Olivier Clapp and, you know, all, right. these, all these young, young people taking over historic domains, but they're still extremely well-known domains that are just sure. under a new generation of stewardship and, here I got to meet people who were digging up, you know, plots and planting or restoring an old vineyard that was outside of their house and the energy and passion that they were bringing to much less expensive and prestigious wines and appellations just absolutely made me more excited about the region that I love and have put so much energy into than I ever have before. Um, and those are the wines that I want to get out and start hollering about and supporting and sharing so, with people. And, you know, that's one of the things I was going to ask you is, you know, you alluded to the fact that, you know, there's all price points, you know, whether the wines are expensive or not, but the new people you're talking about seem like they're making wines that could be of great quality and great value. Um, so I'd be curious, not now, but down the road, you know, to see, you know, how that plays out and that, you know, there is some, you know, terrific sort of new blood in the area. Not that it needs it, but it's just the evolutionary growth. Um, you know, I asked you, um, you know, what makes the region so special? I mean, you kind of nailed it on the answer. I mean, it's a very emotional, you know, deeply committed, you know, people don't, 
connect to things <laughs> necessarily the way you described, you know, your love and interest in Rowan Wines. And it, it was fairly eloquent. So that was nice. That being said, and I agree with you on everything, less the fact that I haven't traveled there, but look to do that one day. Are there other regions or areas that are exciting you and you know we're gonna have to take a break soon and that's when we'll talk about tippling but i would think you have to think about all different wines for the wine bar in the market but you know anything else that seems fun and exciting to you like specific wines or regions? Yeah, anything. Region specific. I'm all, you know, I'm always up for laying suggestions and knowledge to my listeners. So whatever you got, you know, you don't no pressure. What I mean, do you think of? Since I got down here, I was, you know, spending a good amount of time with Justin Coleman at Monarch, uh, which is a very cool wine merchant. Yeah, very cool. With an eye towards curation, right? Yeah, I mean he he gets he gets it. He's a former New Yorker and uh, he took me under his wing uh, just with the idea of adapting to the South. And, you know, I'm, I come from a very conventional background and, you know, the natural wine scene is just never been for me. Not that I don't appreciate. I think I asked you on the last show. Yeah, not that I don't appreciate the well-made wines or even the passion for those who love that, you know, more power to them. It just hasn't been, you know, what drives me. And has that changed or uh, no, do you that, view that it? Changed. I have the same approach that I will always have. And that's, you know, my job is to help make it easier for the average consumer to understand what they're spending their hard earned dollars on and what they like and what they don't like and how to guide those decisions. Quote unquote, natural wine with no definition, no legal boundaries. Anybody can say their wine is natural. That's what bothers me. I don't, I, I, I agree with you on that. I don't mind the passion behind whatever, but I would rather take the approach of farming and respect for land. And it's probably what I. Uh, well, ironically, without even bringing up natural, organic, biodynamic, I mean, those are the practices of many or most of the winemakers, let's say in the Northern Rhone alone. So, I mean, Burgundy, you know, that hallowed expensive wine where people have some perception of it. A lot of these guys have been, you know, organic um, or even biodynamic for years. Um, all right, listen, we got to take a quick break. We're talking to Matthew Conway. Matthew recently left New York or left New York uh, during the pandemic, settled in Charleston, and uh, just opened a new wine bar called Tippling House, which we're going to talk about when we return. You're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. This episode is brought to you by Visit Ithaca, helping you to plan your next getaway. Ithaca has waterfalls and wineries, art and theater, outdoor recreation, and family fun. The area is famous for its glacier-carved gorges, co-op-run businesses, and cultural influences from Cornell University and Ithaca College. Plus, you can't beat the beauty of Cayuga Lake, the largest of the Finger Lakes. Beyond 150 waterfalls and some of the region's best hiking trails, Ithaca is cider. The area is well known for its local cideries, which are leading the way in America's cider revival. You can hear from the region's cider makers directly on HRN series Hardcore. There's something really special about Ithaca's climate for cultivating delicious apples steeped in history and terroir. Let Visit Ithaca help you plan your next trip to this hub of food, drink, culture, and agritourism. Home of New York's craft cider, I love New York. Get started at visitithaca.com. Okay, we're back. We're back with my guest, Matthew, Matthew Conway. Matthew is now the proprietor of Tippling House, a brand new wine bar in probably one of the most exciting food and wine towns in the country, Charleston. 
Um, so let's talk about your new wine bar, Tippling House. Tell me, you know, we talked about a little of where you were, where you were going, how things started, how things ended, but we didn't, Tippling House didn't come up much. So how did the idea come about? Um, you know, why now? Is this something that was always in the plans in the back of your head forever? You know, wh wh why now? Um, I mean, I've always wanted to own a wine bar and that's kind okay. of, you know, the, the kind of the direction I was going towards with the basement at Peasant pre-pandemic. and Right. You know, I wasn't necessarily looking to open a wine bar, but I wanted to see what was out. I, was, I had all types of, you know, doors open. I imported a pallet of wine um, and just shared it with some of my friends in the community down here, which is what I was, I was speaking about earlier that we talk about now. You know, when we got here, the community which had been here long before I, the reason why so many great wines come here to Charleston when they don't go to, let's say, you know, Savannah or Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa, Oklahoma, or you know, whatever, whatever right. small town it is, is because, you know, you, you mentioned Rick Rubel earlier. He was been at Charleston Grill and, you know, with you know, Mickey over there and they set up this Mecca of, you know, fine dining for the South or Charleston or, or South Carolina. And, you know, then you had Fig and, you know, Kevin Kelly had a wine bar down here who does imp import uh, through a company called Avant Partier. You know, may, he joked the other day, 15 years before it's time, but, you know, then it's <laughs> uh, good other line. people like David McCarris, who is an importer here and does a lot of direct importing and, you know, it's just a, there's a community of people down here that that kind of offspring, you know, you get uh, Femi and Miles at Graft. And uh, so whether it's the distribution sign side or the, or the wine community now, whether it's Justin at Monarch or, you know, Miles and Femi at Graft or Josh at Wine and Company or Sarah at Edmonds Oast Exchange, like there's a group of people down here that care. And, you know, there's the people that brought the wines down here that might have not had the type of consumer another market has, but they forced it. They made a way, they taught people, they, you know, pushed things in a way to make it possible for, you know, all of the great wines to make their way to this market, even if the clientele isn't as sophisticated and that's not a knock on them. It's just a big tourist um, destination. So you get a bunch of people of all walks of life coming from all over the country. So, you know, the idea of selling them a bottle of, you know, clap Cornas probably isn't on their radar at $300 right. on a wine list, but those wines right. still come here because the people that I mentioned and many more that I probably forgot, but those people embraced me, man. Um, they, yeah, I, I, they showed me the ropes. They taught me the system down here. And it, after 20 years in New York, I didn't come down here trying to think I knew it all. I came down here with an open mind, trying to understand a small town and how things worked. And they drank with me. They laughed with me. They shared with me. They opened their doors for me. They accepted my New York mentality and my loud mouth and uh, <laughs> embraced me as an outsider, but, uh, you know, uh, accepted me as a, as a local. Once I decided that I was staying down here, most of everybody I mentioned, if not more, uh, you know, now it's Andrew at Charleston Grill. I mean, they want me to succeed. They want me to stay here. They helped in the, in the business. So once I knew I had the support of the community that felt really, really good, I knew it was time to do something. So I looked for locations potentially to do anything. It wasn't have a specific thing in mind. And I, just for context, like when was this, when did you like physically start walking out the door and looking at buildings? Oh, I mean, I started last right. summer, summer of 2020. Like, I, Okay, it was always, you always looked at things like this could be that. I mean, I just, it's a small town. I wanted to have my I get finger it. on the pulse. Yeah. So yeah, 
I mean, I would just look at things like there's a couple neighborhoods that I just really love here. So I would just like take a peek at what the open inventory was like. And, you know, I met a few people that were putting stuff up for sale or, you know, look at a space that was just completely open just to see what was out there. And I would say I got much more serious in, in early 2021 as far as just like really like going out and hustling, right. looking at as much as possible. And, and ready to pull the trigger. I wasn't ready to pull the trigger. I was just I was just a little bit more aggressive about it for several reasons. And then some of our best friends down here happened to um, own chef and operate the best restaurant in town, in our humble opinion, which is called Chubby Fish. Your fishing um, buddy. My fishing buddy, James London. Uh, and it's a very good restaurant. His partner, Yo-Yo, oh, Yoana, I should say, but she, I call her Yo-Yo. Um, you know, there's farm to table and then there's ocean to table. And James buys the whole cooler full of fish. When we go out with the charter, uh, the charter that we love down here, uh, Shane Sinclair, um, if anybody needs to go out and catch some big ass fish, uh, send me a note and I'll set you up with Shane. Um, I just saw a recent Instagram. You, you really, you really nailed it recently. uh, I mean, those are some of the biggest fish I've seen you pull in like all summer, all, you know, it's that time of year. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean it's striper season up here and I ain't catching them like crazy. So, Um, you know, I mean, kudos to you. So, when we go yeah. out, like we catch fish and, you know, he's like, oh man, you know, I, I throw this junk fish back. And James is like, whoa, whoa, we'll keep that. Cause James uses everything. He cooks the dog fish and sea robins. Oh, he'll cook it all. He does. Yeah. He'll, he'll There's do, nothing he'll, wrong with him. He'll do, you know, he'll tempura fry it and dip it in sauce. He'll, you know, when right. we caught King mackerel or uh, bonnet head sharks, you know, he, he makes them into, uh, a curry dish so the meat's more braised slowly right he does crazy he, he pounds it bl- thin. he pounds it thin and makes shark schnitzel so you pound out all the sinew and fries right. it like pork schnitzel i mean he's just a master and the, the food is just incredible and the day before they were open reopening after the pandemic i stopped in to drink a bottle of wine and say congratulations and she pointed out the space that we now in inhabit and it's 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 it up, up to, north of Northern King Street, right? It's it's oh no 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 it's it's not far from the university, right? It's a block south of Chubby Fish. It's on the corner right. of Spring and Coming. And she said, "Oh, I used to eat lunch there at the Bubble Tea Place, and I came down here, and there's no for lease sign on the window. And when I got bingo, uh, bingo, you- bingo, when the for lease sign was up, right?" No, it wasn't. There was nothing on the window. So I texted oh. the broker and she contacted the owners and they were like, oh, like w- we hadn't put it up yet because we thought somebody else was interested. And um, it all worked out, man. They flipped me the keys that very first day. And that was in April uh, when Chris and I had just gotten our, our second vaccination, which uh, everybody should do. We uh, came straight here from our second shot. And the, after the first meeting with the owner, he flipped me the keys that day. So I had an opportunity to be a little ahead of the curve. And then I just knew it just all felt right. Kind of like the meeting Chris in the Northern Rhone, like, you know what it's meant to be. And in this tough market for labor, you know, I, I didn't have... I didn't have any investors or, or partners and I just wanted to do things my way. And, you know, there's something nerve wracking about that, but also liberating about it. And very much so. I did. So tell, that. go ahead. Tell me about, um, we'll finish that thought, but I want you to tell me about, you know, the wine list. I mean, you literally had a clean palate, you know, no ton imp- intended to really put, you know, the type of wines out there that you wanted, but knowing you, you know, you probably put some faves, but you also want to, you know, introduce people to wines and sort of reflect what's going on around there. Um, so to finish, is the it point, harder to go ahead is, you know, 
I signed, we went to France um, in July, which was, you know, fuel for the soul and stayed with Jean Gonon for a couple nights in Mauve before we headed south to where Baby G's located at in outside of Montpellier and Palavas. And, you know, we got to see our own friends and we came back on August 3rd and on August 4th, I signed the lease and everybody told me it's going to take forever and the city moves so slow. And the, the city was absolutely atrocious in their handling of opening a new business, which I will address with the uh, the mayor and the powers that be what (laughs) what an absolute shit show that was but everybody told me it wasn't possible but from uh getting the keys or signing the lease on august 4th you know we opened 11 weeks later and that's including full renovation and without a, a strong labor pool i didn't realize it until about three weeks in when um someone said so basically you're, you're operating as your own general contractor and I'd never done anything like that. I'm not a handy guy. And I certainly had not (laughs) thought of it that way until they said that. And I realized, you know, the post and courier article, which is basically the New York times of, of Charleston is coming out next week. And in the interview with them, I've generally contracted this whole project from soup to nuts, tables, to chairs, floors, painting, demo, all, you know, electrical, plumbing, all of that stuff. I, I contracted individually uh, people myself uh, in a really tough market and built relationships and had backup plans and did a lot of the work myself. And wow. the centerpiece of that was a fishing buddy of mine um, telling me that there was a, a, a brick fireplace that needed to be exposed. And so we exposed that bad boy from 1891 that had been covered up since 1920 and had it repointed from a Mason uh, that's really famous down here and polished her up. And it's the centerpiece of the living room, which is, you know, the wine bar sits in a old Charleston single home. So it's like being in a house and, It's got a great feeling. So the wine list I wanted to make to be very approachable and comfortable. So, you know, we have by the glass, you know, some sparkling, handful of whites, a couple skin contacts, orange-ish, rosé, then moving into light reds and a handful of reds. But then we've got bubbles, orange, pink, white, and red. And all of the bottles on that list, sorry, the list is printed and dated daily. So today after this, I'm going to print uh, new lists with the take off the wines that sold last night, add a few more, move some stuff around, and then we're going to date it November 3rd. We stamp it with our logo and everything that's on that list uh, that's not by the glass are well below normal restaurant markups. Um, So the prices are, are extraordinary. And then we offer any of those bottles by the half bottle for half the bottle price. So for instance, you know, uh, it just makes things really approachable. You asked about a wine that I'm excited about and I kind of got off on a tangent, but a wine that I met down here for the first time through Justin at Monarch, Les Corti from Bougie in the Savoie. It's a Chardonnay Altesse blend from a winemaker that used to work for Demore and Chablis. And the wine spell are- less spell less Corti for me because I post all this. L E S new word C O R T I S. And they have a bunch T-I-S. of days. And the one that I have is called Naxied, N A X I D E. And um the wines, who's going to walk in off the streets of Car- Charleston and order a bougie from the Savoie? <laughs> this doesn't make much sense. Nobody. It's, it's $62 on our list. So you can get a half bottle for 31 bucks, meaning wow. basically 15 bucks a glass. Right. So We're we super start interesting. selling it that way and people are really open to suggestions. And we really, our goal was to have this small daily list of fun wines from all over the world with no rules. Um, you know, we got the last case of, uh, Envinate, uh, one of their, you know, unique bottlings. We got one case yes. of it. it was $60 on the list. And so it was 30 bucks a half bottle or $15 a glass. And we sold the f- whole case in a week because people were so excited to taste it. And, you know, then we've got a half a craft open and we can sell that by the glass or by the bottle. And, I was more worried than anything, not about the business being successful or 
about, uh, you know, the commitment I was giving. I was more nervous of whether or not the clientele or the customers were going to be open to this type of uh, experimental drinking. I was worried that, you know, they were just going to want to drink Pinot Grigio and Chardonnay right. by the glass. Sauvignon but Blanc. I was absolutely stunned through the first two weeks and first day of the third week yesterday. You know, I had a customer walk in and order a bottle of 09 Wind Gap Syrah that I bought on wine bid back in New York and traveled with me all this way that my buddy Pax made. Sure. And they popped a half bottle of it and sure enough, you know, two minutes later, the table in the corner that had started with a glass and had a glass of Session Syrah, another great friend of mine. So I'm also supporting a lot of friends here, um, wanted to drink something a little bit bigger. And I'm like, how about this bottle of 09 packs? It's only, you know, whatever it was, 38 bucks for the half bottle. And they're like, we're in. Like nobody says no. So it's like what I set out to do is exciting. And I had a group of young ladies in, in their early 20s that are all studying for their WSET and they were like tell us how you put together the wine list in your head like how did how many did you taste and I was standing over them and they had a glass of Riesling a glass of Pax Trousseau Gris skin contact a glass of Cherisuolo Rosé from Tibiero a glass of Vivantaire Orange and a glass of um, Syrah and it looked like a rainbow on the table. And while I was answering this young lady's question, they were all like, taste this, taste this. And sharing this s rainbow of Skittles across the table with excitement. And I said, this is exactly what I had in mind to put a bunch of different styles of wine that might be out of the ordinary for normal wine drinkers in color and texture and flavor profiles and make them affordable and allow people the opportunity to share and converse and um, gather around the beverage that I love so much at a price point that's comfortable so that they can be excited about wine and to do it in a market like this with the support of the community. Uh, wine Sounds like you nailed it. Physically behind me has been two weeks in heartwarming and I hope <laughs> to keep getting the message out and filling this room and, telling the story, which is what our real mission is, is working with producers that whether you consider them are natural or not, I don't care. I want to support people who farm properly, respect their water table, uh, provide for their communities where they grow their grapes. And that's really what it's about. Do, I mean, it a, do it in a humane and ethical manner. And I'm going to buy those wines. I'm going to support those wines. And I'm going to tell their story table side so that the people who are drinking them can get to know the producer and gain a little bit of knowledge that makes them excited and a little bit deeper than just drinking a glass of wine. And not everybody wants a story, but for those who want it, the Tippling House is a place where you're going to have a sommelier at your table. It's me every night. I touch every table. But, you know, as we move forward, I've got a great team, Eric and Jillian here now. And as we grow more people who are going to be there to walk you through the list, talk you into a half bottle or a full bottle or a glass of something that you feel comfortable with. And then I put my personal stash on a separate list off to the side so that when people in town want to rip a $200 bottle of, of champagne or a you high got it. burgundy or something that we're a place in town where you can be casual and wear flip flops and drink Rulo or Ravino or Alamond and do it right. at a very low price point. Um, so I put that on there and we've sold a lot of that already. So we're, we're moving and grooving. Matthew, it's, it sounds awesome. You know, it sounds like you were able to execute um, what you imagined. And it just, it, it sounds like, you know, a wonderful place. I mean, it sounds like the variety, the value, the vibe, you know, the knowledge, the intention. I mean, it, 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 it sounds wonderful. I'm very um, happy for you. And I think we're going to be down there in a few months. So, of course, that'll be uh, one of our first stops. Yeah. I um, think, so that, I think that what's, the quick goal was to have, you know, a group of ladies that are here staying at Airbnbs for a wedding, drinking rosé or Pinot Grigio by the glass, sitting next to somebody in the wine industry or food and beverage right. industry down here, drinking something that they've never had before by the half craft, sitting next to 
a local Charlestonian that might have a house on the water drinking some aged Bordeaux sitting next to one of my buddies that's really into natural wine, crushing a bottle of, you know, Bichy or, you know, Laura Lorenzo or something that is, you know, quote unquote natty and fun and have all of those people existing in the same space. As you said, something for everybody. And that's yeah. what we've done so far. And after it the hiatus like of not being on the floor, you know, I can't tell you it's going to last forever, but the energy and passion I have for what we're doing in this space right now is as strong as anything I've ever done. And I'm it's take it one. Right for take day. it one week at a time. Don't worry about it. Sure, I'm just saying. I'm so excited. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I, it, it sounds like you have the formula for success there. I'm just um, excited there's... for the doors to open tonight and get the people in here and and do what I do best, which is how awesome is that? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's what I missed and what I loved, and getting back to it. You know, being on my feet and working nights again isn't the easiest transition, but the energy I have when I wake up in the morning, knowing I'm going to get to do what I love today after not having it for so long, is uh, it's nice. It's nice. Invigorating. All right, listen, we have to. We're running out of time. We're actually way over time, but I'm not giving in. Um, we do a thing called the wine list. And you did this when you were on last time. We ask all our guests five questions. Everyone gets asked the same five questions because we don't have a lot of time. Don't dwell on the answers. But our listeners are interested, certainly after listening to you for the past hour, in the type of wines you drink, are interested in, recommend. So the first question, we may have answered it you know, through the interview. But the first question is, what are you drinking now? What What's interesting you? What's in your fridge at home? You know, what are you tasting for the, um, for tippling? You know, what's top of mind right now? Couple things. Uh, as I said momentarily ago, the Les Corti is a wine that I've been super, super excited about. All right. Um, so Les Corti, give me another one. The Tibiero Chirisuolo, which just ran out down here, is uh, Tibiero's the maker, right? Correct. Chirisuolo. Okay. Um, um, that's give me from Abruzzo in Italy, and those wines are just absolutely stunning. Um, um, is Chirisuolo the grape, Matthew? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there's a. I'm trying to give you stuff that I hadn't known before I got down here that excite me. There's a producer <laughs> from Ribeiro in Spain called Luis Rodriguez, and they make whites and the white. Um, they make several blends, but the white that I'm into is Os Passas, uh, the varietal. Os Passas. The varietal you have to look up, but it's just such a beautiful look it up. expression of white wine that I absolutely dig. All right, that's enough. Okay. I'm going to post those because um, I want to cover all questions. The second question is sort of the goofiest, but you're a food guy and certainly you're a wine guy. So, And I'm curious what you said last time. Favorite wine and food pairing. Not something you eat every night, month, whatever, but something that, you know, just ooh ah resonates. What well, works? My favorite, without a doubt, is uh, carnitas and Modelo Especial. Okay, <laughs> sounds like uh, beer and carnitas, man. At the end of the day, keep it. It's, it sounds like a night out with Capiello. But if, right. yeah, exactly. But if you really want a wine instead of a beer, like one thing that I no, don't... no, I want the honest answer, and that's it. You cool. know, I didn't. I, I said favorite wine and food pairing, but it's really favorite beverage and food pairing. All right, third question. If you don't like beer and carnitas, I can't be friends with you. Right, that's a criteria. All right, you've moved around a little. I ask people what their favorite wine restaurant and or a bar is. Um, I think maybe you answered it a little, but we're going to key back in. I think we're going to leave New York behind and talk about Charleston. And let's put it in the context of good wine, knowledgeable people, good vibe, you know, good food or snacks. Who's doing that in your mind? Graf. Give me two or three. Graft that, you know, 
the vibe, the music, the selection. I agree. Give me something else. I mean, Graft is just so good because, you know, part of the, we're closed on Sundays and Mondays here at the wine bar. And part of the reason why we did it is because Graft does Femi created Good Neighbor Sunday on Sunday yeah. from three to six. They've got a food truck out front and they can tent the parking lot because their neighbors aren't open on the weekends and right. everybody comes out and it's the perfect, it's so European and vibe with like, I always feel obligated to buy a bottle just so I can contribute, but I'd never need to buy more than one because the wine just flows. People are sharing, everybody's tasting. Yeah. So it's, it's a community. A good, it's such a good vibe. Give me a, one other place. Uh, that I'd like to go f- specifically for wine. Well, no. Here's the question. I'll read it again. Your favorite wine restaurant and or bar. And whatever the criteria that makes that good for you, that's how you come to your answer. And graft is selection, vibe, the people. You know, what else, you know, do you like? Uh, I like... It's such a hard. It's such a hard. Does chubby to, Does chubby fish have a good wine list? They have a simple wine list by the glass that fits all of their food, and I love right. going there. But I usually, you know, the wine's perfect for the food. Perfect. Uh, it's, but due to space, it's it's, it's by the glass. Yeah. List. So it's like you know you rip yeah. a glass of muscadet with oysters, and then you know you have a glass of which is which is perfect. Yeah, you I mean, know it doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't have to though. be. I mean, I mean I you know, look, chubby fish. I bring my own wine there a lot just because it's right down the street from my house, and Yo Yo is fine with it. But it's not because the wine list isn't good. It's it's a great wine list. No, no, I program. you 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 kind of sort it is out. The best restaurant in town. Period. I couldn't be if you come to uh, Charleston and you don't go to Chubby Fish, you didn't come to the real Charleston, in my opinion. But I'll give somebody else a shout out. I like um, Estadio. It's a Spanish tapas place. They've got one in D.C. as well. The right. ownership is just really competent, and they have competent. I mean, like they're good operators, but they're just good hospitality people in such a warm setting, and they do Spanish tapas, and the food is always flavorful and seasoned and delicious and just yummy, man. And then they've got a cool, fun little Spanish wine list with, you know, you can do what you could want to do, but they've got a gin and tonic program where you can pick your gin nice. and pick your own, own tonic to match the gin. And it's just good food, good wine, good cocktails. You know, they've got Vichy water. It's, it feels, it feels great. So I can talk Sounds about very cool. and graft all day long, but I'll give Estadio the shout out. That's like, those are good ones. Uh, I didn't mention, but we post all our guests, um, wine list answers on social media um, because people are interested, like I said earlier. All right, fourth question. Like I said, you did this once before, so I'm curious, and don't even jog your memory. Um, I asked you what your favorite all-time wine was. There's a good chance when you came on, I was fishing around for, you know, Matt, what's the most expensive rare wine you ever drank? The question has evolved more to, that favorite all-time wine, what's that wine that made the impression on you? You know, that maybe was a gateway wine, that maybe was that champagne when you got engaged, that, you know, just to, you know, what's that important, you know, wine to you today? I mean, there's definitely a few wines. In, that, in, go with a few. I don't, in you the know. the trajectory of my career, I talked before we came on about 89 Luigi and Audi Barolo that was left to me by a guest. Right. That's a good, when I was a see, server, that's sort of a gateway. When I was a server at Pache in New York in the early days and that, you know, I was, I was struggling with the, the amount of knowledge required to pass my wine tests and that that wine made me know I was on the right path. But another one I'll give you that's special to Chris and I is when we, she's Puerto Rican. And when we went to Puerto Rico together for the first time, we went, you know, we drank pina coladas and, you know, rum and tequila constantly and sat on the beach and did that thing a lot. And finally, after a few days of that, we were like, you know, I was like, I'm in the mood for a little wine. She was like, me too. And we found this little restaurant. I think the chef was a 
Top Chef or some some right. program that stood out as like a little whatever. And we went down, and they had a bottle of uh, Pierre Yves Colin Moray. Uh, I think it was just Bourgogne Blanc. It was Bourgogne Blanc that was sitting on the shelf up in the corner, and it was like four vintages <laughs> old. <laughs> it wasn't at temperature controlled and there was no air no. in this place. So it just been sitting up there in 85 degree weather for four years. That's a risk, man. How was, was it? I was like, yeah, you know, whatever. I'm worth the risk. So we pulled the cork and it was absolutely mind bogglingly delicious. And maybe, really, the, maybe the heat kind of accelerated the, right, 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 the right. aging the whole- process a little bit. So it was a little bit ready to drink, but it was just fresh and lively and packed with, flavor and you know it was just so in such a perfect place see that that's that's how you answer the question it immediately you know, became it, one of our chris and i's or it's definitely one of her favorite it's probably her favorite producer if you ask her off to the side which is all fun and dandy until you realize that you're marrying a woman that asks for pycm everywhere you go and at those prices i'm gonna have to like become a banker to keep her yeah no to, kidding to satiate her hey PYCM stop, first. stop complaining she's worth it no I right, know, so, i'm not complaining i'm just saying <laughs> I like, know, I know. i'm like hey, i put, wor- you, you couldn't I put words in like, your mouth i don't know tompier rose <laughs> yeah, right right pycm right. I know it's a, it's a good thing though. All right, final question, and you should be able to handle this one because of all your exposures in the wine business. The question is to recommend best wine around fifteen, twenty, twenty-two bucks, a red and a white. Um, you know, my kids are in their twenties; they can't show up at uh, parties with you know cheap wines. They can't afford forty, fifty bucks. Same thing about bringing to dinner and gifts, all that. So, give me a red. Give me a white. Um, it could be category like, you know, Muscadet is a great value. It goes great with oysters. Um, you can give me makers. What comes to your mind for a white and what comes to your mind for a red? Um, Come on. You should you wanted it, I'm sorry. You wanted it at $15 a bottle of retail? Retail. 15 20 22 uh, You know, in the, in the high teens, low 20s so hard because i think i told you the same thing last time i don't think of um i don't think of wine at retail prices but i would say all right all right so wait listen that's fair and there's a good chance that uh, you know it's coming back to me where do you think and i never use the word cheaper and expensive where do you think the good values are in wine for a red for a white i'll give you something i know specific for red Go for white. I would say, and I again, I hope I didn't say the same thing last time. Not that it doesn't matter. That just validates. To remember, but for me, rosé is the category that if you like white wine, you can drink white wine. Speaking of PYCM, you can drink right. PYCM rosé at thirty-five dollars a bottle retail ish. Again, I don't know exactly what it goes for. Whereas if you want whites or, you know, they're serious stuff, they go from 80 to $1,500 a bottle. So it's like with rosé, you can oftentimes drink wine from some of the most famous and sought after producers and get to touch their fruit and their labels and their magic at a price point that's so much more affordable. And while I love white wine and I think that white wine is important, um, I think that drinking rosé is a great way to you know you can bring it to a barbecue you can bring it to the beach people say it's a summertime wine i adamantly disagree no there's been so many so much written up now that it's not a summertime wine to your point in the morning like you do what you got to do you can pour it over ice there's spritzy rosé there's bold rosé that's almost as big as light red wines. I think rosé is a category that is extremely packed with value. And it's one of the few categories that you haven't seen go up exponentially no. among the great producers over the past five or 10 years. So my money, stick rosé. For red wine? So are, wait, so are we thinking you said that last time? I think you did. I think I might have said that. because Which is it. fine. but And I agree with you. All right, so go red now. I'll just... Shout out my my 
buddy who you mentioned earlier, Patrick Capiello, who's doing Monte Rio wines in uh, California with Pax. And I shout out Patrick just because he's in a short period of time, he's really focused on a market that is what you're talking about. He's trying to make wines that are, that he can connect his, um, you know, industry fame or, you know, notoriety in the industry to a market that's young and inexperienced and make wine comfortable for them. And, you know, the Monte Rio single vineyard wines are exceptional expressions at a low price point that I buy and drink personally. When right. Come out with the red, white and red skull labels. Right. Um, those are blends, Matthew. Those are blends. And right. I have the red skull blend, uh, on by the glass for ten dollars here at the table. Wow, that's great! Uh, but I also see his Saint Giovese and Magnums around town, which is inexpensive as well. And I've didn't been he do a straw to- bottle, San yeah, G- Giovese? San- with the yeah. bottle. But I've been oh, serving that- it to people here at the wine bar that just want something easy and approachable. That's not too thought provoking. That's not too serious. That isn't geeky and i told you i want to tell stories and the stories don't have to be serious we're not talking about soil types or you know climates or winemaking i want to tell stories about people and humans their dogs what they look like what they feel like i want to connect people with you know vignerons and people who are passionate about wine and patrick being one of my best friends is a really person you know good person to connect people with and uh, his wines are exactly what you want at that price point of sub twenty, fresh, delicious, easy drinking. You know, you can well crush a bottle and wake up without a hangover. They've got fun right. labels. They check every box. And I, I agree with you. you I think that you complimented me earlier on like coming up with a plan and executing it. And you know, we're only two weeks old, so you know, time will bear the the reality of how well this you know, philosophy that we set out to do takes to the market. But Patrick's proving with increased production year over year that people are digging what he's doing. And there's a reason because it's, it's uh, a simple approach to doing something that sometimes just gets overcomplicated. And Patrick, with the help of Pax from a winemaking side, who's obviously a brilliant winemaker and makes great wines himself that everybody can check out at, at reasonable price points. We sell the Trousseau Gris here and just crush with that by the glass as well. But, you know, those are wines that you should seek out and you can find them online uh, and have them delivered if it, in almost every market and they're inexpensive and worth every penny. That's a great um, answer. And I've, you know, Patrick has been on the show and we've tasted his wines, and that's a good segue. We don't have a lot of time left, Matt. We literally have a few minutes, but at the end of the show, we do a feature called the Weekly Wine Sip, and it's an opportunity um, to connect with the guests, whether they're the winemaker or you know they have a program um, or a passion or whatever. And I knew you and I were doing a remote recording and i know your love of the rhone and i share that with you and i share going on so i asked if you and i could taste the wine on air and we agreed on the 2018 um pierre gonan saint joseph made by jean gonan and you and i are gonna sip it and talk about it for a second but first just quickly tell me about the wine the wine that we're tasting is Mm. Uh, 100% Syrah from Saint Joseph from a producer called Pierre Gonon that's now made by Pierre's sons Pierre and Jean Uh, it's from three different appellations in Saint Joseph blended together Uh, it's almost 100% whole cluster in every vintage and very minimal intervention in the winemaking process, but completely organic and sustainable farming in the vineyards, which is backbreaking farming, right? Farming on those hills. It's one of, if not my favorite wine producer on the planet. Uh, And 
17, 18, 19, and 20 were an anomaly of stretch of vintages in the Northern Rhone that were all very hot and very dry, which is uh, extremely out of the normal for them um, and a sign of global warming. And Syrah is a little bit different when it's hot and dry. I think that climate's a little bit more suitable for Grenache in the South. So it was a stretch of kind of uniquely difficult vintages and this wine itself, uh, I think, is a great example of the benefits of solid farming. It comes in at a low 13.5 for the hot and dry vintage. And I think robust off the nose, you get a lot of that traditional, like, purple flowers. Oh, incredible, like lavender or violet. Lilac, or not... Lilacs, lavender, lots of Lilac, lavender. right. Which and the color is the that, color is a deep dark, right? I mean, typical. Deep and dark, but it's not opaque. I've got my wine list underneath it, and I can kind of make out the yes. letters through the wine. So it's, it's yeah. a little bit softer than dark and brooding, but you can get a little bit of smokiness and that herbaceousness that comes with those flowers. And I certainly think there's that, you know, hint of you know, kind of animal fat, whether you want to call it roasted or charcuterie, but there's definitely Bacon that kind of meaty or... meatiness that you get from Syrah. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely a little, um, you know, it's a little saucy, like a little reduction here, which happens to these wines, you know, a year or two after they're bottled to kind of start closing up. I think this is still quite open, but I think it's starting to get into that little reductive stage that they usually hit for three to five years before they come back out. But I think you know, a little bit more time open will benefit the, the mouthfeel, you know, you, it, it's, I don't want to say it's a big wine, but the mouthfeel is like perfect. It's not thin and it's not this like mouth coating glycerin -y, you know, it's just mouth filling. I think right. It, I, I mean, it has, a, it's like, you know, to be nerdy, like medium plus bodied to, to that's what I was going to say. Your sentiment It's it's not like, heavily tannic or super no dark and brooding no. it's it's it kind of has a, a lightness to it even though it's got a full mouth feel tannins are what very um fine and and silk very it's fine got tannins. A really soft balance to it and a very like, does the palate match the nose is think, there anything new on the palate too fine. you know that you get a little bit more uh fruit on the palate than you got mm. on the nose like i get a little i bit agree more, like you know, blackberry and kind of that, you know, even a little bit of red fruit on here, which I think is unique yes. for Syrah. Like there's almost like a, a cranberry aspect to the, to the wine yeah. palette. But I definitely think you the get- The nose is more taste. floral to me. Yeah, yeah. The nose was a touch more floral, but I think it's got great balance and, and length. It's not a super long wine, but it's got a, a, a round- nah, It's pretty, it's got it. a good finish. Super. It's got a, what's, what are the- um, what are the perfect foods to pair with wines like this? I mean, I pair uh, Syrah with air uh, on a regular basis. You know, <laughs> air, air and Syrah is a, is a great pairing to me. Uh, but in all seriousness, I like the wines to be a little bit colder, uh, not ice cold, but definitely cellar temp or even a little bit lower. I think Syrah really that crunchy kind of snappy aspect yep. of the wines comes out when they're a little bit colder and, you know, while I think they go well with a lot of things, uh, one of the things that stands out in my mind is one of my good friends and one of the best chefs on planet Earth for good old uh, soulful cooking, uh, in my opinion, Daniel Eddy, who has winner in Brooklyn. Oh, my um, God. I just ate there. I, actually, I went to Patrick's uh, wine tasting. Maybe the best chicken I've ever had. I mean, if you haven't messed with Daniel Eddy's food, you... you oh, my God. And then he just opened Runner Up. Let's give that a plug. Sure, uh, sure. His been, little wine bar. I haven't been since Runner Up's been open, but it'll be on uh, my short list when I'm back next weekend. The place is awesome. I'm glad you brought it up, man. But he used to cook a veal porterhouse at Rebel, and it was, uh, you know, a fatty yeah. piece of veal that was cooked to perfection and you know that it was simply prepared there wasn't it wasn't sauced up or anything and cold syrah which is all patrick had flowing for us i mean we did gonon and alamond and all these crazy uh, grio fun dinners there and the syrah was always cold and you put that 
you know, fatty veal porterhouse down on the table with some cold, uh, yeah. world class Syrah. And there's few places on earth that feel like heaven, but those tables at Rebel felt that way. And I know <laughs> you make anything night, sound good. The last time we were at uh, Winter. And we had a big group of people sitting outside and he served us those chickens and we were drinking Syrah with those chickens. And <sighs> Is that some of the best chicken you've ever had? Yes. And I, I don't believe it. I mean, I still think about it. I implore anybody out there to, to run to winter. I mean, they don't need my help. They're busier than busy. So we, but. Matthew, we could say it winter, winter, chicken dinner, go and eat it. Winter. All right. We got to wrap up, man. This may be the longest show I've ever done. All right. So Sorry, I'm long winded. No, 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 no. I let you go. And I wanted to, but uh, I get yelled at by my people at heritage. Um, all right, let me do a wrap up and I want to get some info from you. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at sam at thegrapenation.com. That's sam at thegrapenation.com. Subscribe to the Grape Nation podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. And subscribe. You know, if you put the time into the show, hit the subscribe button and the show will be delivered to you. You know, there's Matthew Conway waiting, uh, you know, to talk to you for an hour and a half. Uh, follow us on uh, Facebook at The Grape Nation. On Instagram, we're at S. Ben Ruby. On Twitter, we're at Ben Ruby. I know a little confusing, but you could always use the hashtag The Grape Nation to bring it together. Um, as I mentioned, we will post Matt's wine list. I'm going to see if I could dig up the old one and do a little comparison. Um, I will list our weekly wine sip, which obviously both of us are in love with, the uh, 2018 Gonan Syrah from St. Joseph. Um, Matt, if people want to follow you, Matt, where can they find you? And if people want more information on Tippling House, where can they go? Uh, you can drop me a uh, follow at at Conbeezy, C-O-N-B-E-A-Z-I-E on Instagram. I respond to all DMs. Uh, the Tippling House is at Tippling House, C-H-S. And then our website is the Tippling House, C-H-S. And my email is Matthew at the Tippling House, C-H-S. So Instagram, there's no the, but on the right. website and the email, it's the Tippling House CHS. Uh, I respond to all emails. I got a couple that just came in that I'm going to be getting back to for. for right. So Matt, I'm not going on a, out on a limb, but if you're planning a trip to Charleston and if your interest is not peaked after Matt told you what he's doing at Tippling House, then you don't really care about wine. But he's just opened the door. You could shoot him a note and say, hey, we're coming down. You know, where do we come? What do we do? Blah, blah, blah. Um, so definitely make that part of your uh, destination plans, Tippling House. All right, Matt, we got to wrap up. I want to thank our guest, Matthew Conway. Matthew is a soulful, longtime wine guy, and he just fulfilled – uh, part of his dream because we hope there's still some other dreams to fulfill in opening uh, a wine bar that very much has his soul in it called the Tippling House in Charleston. I want to thank our engineer Kevin and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. And thanks for listening. <laughs>